Thank you very much, Gary, and thank you for the opportunity of, of sharing with you in this process. I'm Kent Millard. I was a pastor at St. Luke's United Methodist Church in Indianapolis, a 6,500-member congregation for 18 years. Then I retired, and then I failed retirement. And for the last four years, I've been serving as president at United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio. I've served as a delegate or reserve delegate to six different general conferences. And uh, at each of those general conferences, we had debates over homosexuality. And they increasingly got more intense. And then it culminated in the general conference in St. Louis last year where I was there, uh, I actually supported the One Church Plan, but what concerned me most was the tenor of the debate and the uh, kind of hostility and, and anger that I experienced. And I thought, as leaders of the church, we need to do better than this. We need to do something different than getting together at every general conference and fighting about this. I once read that insanity is defined as doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And we have got the same results over and over again. So I became convinced, sitting in St. Louis, that we need to find a better way forward. And for me, that became, how do we find an amicable separation? That staying together just keeps the fight going. My analogy for this is I once visited Mount Denali in uh, Alaska, and, and outside the uh, visitor center, there are the skeletons of two bull moose that rammed their horns together so hard in a fight that they could not disengage, and they both died. For me, that became a symbol of the United Methodist Church. We have rammed our horns together so hard in this conflict that we're all being taken down and that we need to learn how to disengage so all might live. So it was with that kind of idea that I gathered with a group of progressives, centrists, I consider myself a centrist, and traditionalists at North United Methodist Church where Darren Cushman Wood is the pastor in Indianapolis. It's a reconciling congregation. So we had progressives, centrists, and, and traditionalists. And we only had one thing in common. <clears throat> we agreed that we felt it was time to disengage, find some amicable separation. Now, let me tell you, that first day was a very difficult meeting. We didn't know each other. We didn't trust each other. Everyone was sort of articulating their points of view, their talking points. No one was listening. And we didn't get anywhere. But my wife invited us all to come to dinner at our house that night. I still live in Indianapolis, but work in Dayton. And uh, <clears throat> we decided at the dinner, you couldn't talk about the issue. Just get acquainted with each other. Just find out about each other's background. And the conversation was lively and wonderful. And uh, one of our progressive uh, participants, pastor of a reconciling congregation, told me afterwards, she said, I sat down and then I discovered I was next to Keith Boyette. <clears throat> the president of the Wesleyan Covenant Association. She thought to herself, oh, this is going to be a long night. And then she said, I discovered that Keith Boyette is the kindest, one of the nicest men I've met. He listened. He was concerned about her church and how she ministered. And she said there was a kind of a bonding that surprised us both. Well, those kind of conversations then changed the nature of our conversation the next day. When we got together at North Church, instead of just talk, rehearsing our talking points, we listened to each other, tried to understand where you are and how can we come to a common area of amicable separation. And we discovered that we began to agree on about five different things. Someone wrote them down. We voted on them. They was unanimous on every one of the five. And we were shocked because how far we were apart the previous day. So someone said, it's time for communion. So we went into the chapel at North Church, stood in a circle and served each other communion. And it felt like the Holy Spirit was there. There were tears because barriers had dropped. We saw each other as follow, fellow followers of Jesus Christ. Different opinions, 
but we had respect for each other. And so then we began to develop a plan, and I think the, uh, there's a picture on the screen. No, it's not on the screen. Can you put the picture on the screen of the uh, Indianapolis plan model? It's a, you'll see that shows uh, a path that divides into three different paths. So that symbolized what our plan is about, that there be a path on the right uh, for traditionalists. And that path, they would maintain the current Book of Discipline with the prohibitions about ordaining uh, gay persons and doing weddings. Uh, a path in the center, which would represent the uh, <clears throat> continuing United Methodist Church, which might well have a, something like the One Church Plan, where churches and, congreg and conferences would decide themselves if they'll ordain uh, gay persons and do weddings. A, per a path on the left, which shows uh, the progressive path, where the churches in that denomination, uh, it would be expected that everybody in every church would have gay, be open to gay pastors and do gay weddings. We felt that would be the way of integrity to honor each of these three positions. So we put together the Indianapolis plan with that purpose in mind. Now, I need to add to you that um, since the protocol came out for uh, reconciliation and grace of separation, we discovered it had many of the same elements that we talked about and did something that we were not able to get done. They were able to figure out the finances. We couldn't figure out how to do that. And the protocol did that. So we contacted all the members of our uh, group that signed on the Indianapolis delegation. And we've all now agreed that we will work for the passage of the protocol because it seems to provide a better way forward uh, in handling some of the issues that we could not handle ourselves. One of the things that we did uh, have in our plan that is not included is a suggestion that as delegates, you might want to consider recommending we not elect bishops in July of 2020 because we don't know how it's going to shake out. It'll take a year for churches to decide if they're going to go traditional or remain with a denomination. And you don't know how many churches are going to be, where they're going to be, how you're going to organize conferences. <clears throat> so it might be well to delay election of bishops for a year until that happens. But that's just a suggestion. <clears throat> and then finally, I was very pleased with the uh, scripture that has been chosen from uh, Psalm 46, be still and know that I am God. But you know what? That's verse 10 of Psalm 46. Do you know what verse 9 says? God makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. Then be still and know that I am God. It occurred to me that maybe this is most appropriate, that God is helping us to make this war, this conflict, this 47-year debate to cease and find a positive way forward for everyone. I'd like to invite uh, my good friend and colleague, Reverend Aaron Cushman Wood, pastor at North United Methodist Church, to share some observations. Thank you, Ken. Well, thank you for having us uh, here and uh, the opportunity to share. Um, I just want to cover with you briefly uh, the outline of the plan. So as you're reading it, you have an orientation to what you're seeing. What was on the screen was the website where you can go there and you can uh, look at the legislation itself. Uh, as well as what we call uh, the basic provisions, which is an outline, a summary of the plan, and also a list of all of the authors of the plan as well. Um, the first seven points of the basic provision cover uh, defining those three denominations. And uh, by way of background, uh, we see these as just, number one, a, a starting point. Uh, not a full-fledged uh, uh, view or vision of a denomination, but rather this would be the starting point that would differentiate them from one another. And then second, as part of our process, uh, we allowed each group to define their own uh, denomination. So traditionalists were in charge of defining what that traditionalist uh, denomination would be, for example and on and on. And finally, uh, we were working from the principle uh, that we should not legislate from the grave, the future of these denominations. And so uh, the relationship 
among these denominations uh, is not in the plan because that needs to be left uh, for the future and how they form. So these are starting points. But what we envision would that there would be at least two or three denominations. Uh, the traditionalist branch uh, would have its starting point of affirming, maintaining that traditional stance on issues of sexuality. The uh, centrist branch would, for you know, the sake of shorthand uh, around here, would be a combination of the one church plan and the simple plan uh, as it moved uh, forward. And then the progressive branch would uh, practice immediate full inclusion uh, across the board, um, uh, barring of discrimination, full practice of ordination and itinerancy for LGBTQIA uh, pastors, and all their churches would practice same-sex weddings. Along with this, uh, we also envision, and what's in the legislation is that there would be a continuation of the United Methodist Church, but that legal continuation would be through the centrist uh, branch, that centrist denomination. And so that language is in there as well. Um, the next sections and the basic provisions uh, cover the voting process. And uh, what deeply influenced us was a public comment phase that we went through five weeks prior to uh, filing the legislation. Uh, we went public with what we were doing, and we invited everyone in the denomination to give us uh, their comments and their feedback uh, because we know and understand that we are a very limited group, as all groups are that uh, uh, try to craft legislation. And so we saw that feedback, and it really did shape it. For example, for me, in trying to decide and determine about what ought to be a, a, a voting threshold, I was deeply influenced by the part-time local pastors in Indiana. And if ever there is someone who is marginalized in our denomination, is part-time local pastors uh, in rural and inner city areas. So that's uh, working through this. Um, in the voting process, what we envision uh, is that, number one, no one is required to take a vote. That needs to be very clear. No one has to take a vote. But if you do not vote, uh, you will end up aligning somewhere. There will be a, a default uh, place for you. And so the default setting that we envision for uh, annual conferences in the United States would be into that centrist branch. Uh, outside of the United States, in our central conferences, it would be in that traditionalist uh, branch. And if you want to realign, uh, whether as an annual conference or as a, uh, a local church, it would simply require a simple majority. We also envision that the formation of the progressive denomination could be done outside of an annual conference vote, but rather that it would simply require 50 local churches across the denomination to say that they want to found that denomination, and so that language is in there as well. The next several points in the basic provisions cover things like pensions and, uh, and finances. We're relying upon uh, the legislation that's been offered up by Westpath um, and, uh, uh, and the continuation of those uh, pension liabilities to go into those new denominations. Um, as far as uh, finances and assets, uh, we left that purposely vague and we simply issued a statement uh, that calls upon General Conference to uh, come up with a process and principles uh, for that. Um, we also, as a part of the continuation of the denomination and how things are sorted out uh, in our legislation, calls for certain general agencies uh, to become independent so they can serve all those new denominations. And the rest of the general agencies would remain with that centrist branch. Those that would become independent are Westpath, uh, United Methodist Committee on Relief, UMW, United Methodist Men, uh, the Publishing House as well, and then shared uh, support uh, for the archives. All other uh, general agencies would continue on in that centrist uh, denomination. And then finally, a word about the timeline. 
uh, we felt that it needed to be uh, a swift timeline for those who are ready to uh, uh, begin working on the new student denominations, but at the same time allowing for a great deal of leeway for, at the other end. And so in our timeline, as early as July 1st, uh, local churches could take that vote about how they would align. In August 1st, uh, those, uh, the formation of those new denominations uh, could begin. Uh, during this transition process, uh, we, like other plans, uh, call for a moratorium uh, on those provisions in the Book of Discipline uh, being enforced until there is a, a full realignment, which we would envision would be in the fall of 2021, would be those inaugural general conferences uh, with a stipulation that if there is a progressive denomination that's formed, that it might have a little bit of a later start date. As Kent mentioned, uh, postponing the election of bishops till 2022, and then uh, a final closure date of 2028 for local churches uh, to make that, that final decision. Um, in closing, uh, I would just say that um, we always saw our work as a work on behalf of the delegates and recognize fully that at the end of the day, it is, it's the delegates that make this decision and, and not any small group that meets uh, in any back room or front room in public or in secret, but rather we simply saw our work as providing you with good legislation that you can use to work from to amend, and even if you reject it, at least it will be legislation that is understandable. Having been a general conference delegate, I can tell you it's very frustrating to work with a poor piece of legislation. So with that and our support for the uh, protocols, uh, we would encourage you to look at the Indianapolis plan as a source for uh, perfecting the protocols, but also look at the Indianapolis plan that if things would fall through and the protocols uh, do not work, uh, we think the Indianapolis plan may be a good plan B for you to consider. Thank you very much.